Hi, you can go up there, Andrew. We'll introduce you from here. Um, for those who don't know uh, Andrew's background, uh, for a number of years he was uh, ambassador to the Soviet Union um, for his home country, Sierra Leone. Uh, this was a very uh, dynamic period of time. It was the brezhnev kosijin era, so there was an awful lot going on. Uh, after that, he was um, ambassador to the United Nations for, I think, uh, 18 months or close to two years. Um, and this was um, probably where he, he cultivated the, the strongest interests that he uh, had in bringing us um, to the idea of this conference. And I wanted uh, to give him the opportunity tonight to speak on uh, the international legal and normative framework of international migration um, so that we could touch back, now that we've had a few talks about migration and the types of issues that surround it, we can uh, kind of return back to some of the aspirations of the frameworks that have been put in place to provide support for migratory um, um, peoples and um, he will, of course, also speak to the challenges that this has posed. Andrew. Thank you, sir. Well, good evening, gentlemen and ladies, those of you who are hearing me for the second time today. I hope you still have a desire to listen to me. What I intend to do this evening is to first and foremost lay the groundwork before talking about international law and international migration. When we do so, I would like us to discuss the sources of international migration law. We will wrap my discussions this evening by looking at the New York Declaration of, 16, of 2016 and the pending conference where a global compact on migration, migrants, and refugees will be adopted. With that said, it goes without doubt that the movements of people either within nation states or outside of nation states is not new. People have always been on the move. Some people move in search of maybe economic opportunities. Others move looking for opportunities that may not be easily available in their own home countries. Others move so as to escape conflict, poverty, or food insecurity. Some move because of human rights violations imposed upon them. Still others move, as our last speaker said, because of climate change, natural disasters, as well as other environmental factors. Many move as well because of a combination of all these factors. Others move because the grass it's always greener on the other side. They move because of macroeconomics or microeconomic factors or for family reconnections, etc. 
This evening, I want to ask you not to squeeze me on the reasons why people would move, but to simply focus on the international protection of migrants. Let's however note that today, indeed, we are witnessing an unprecedented level of human mobility. The number of international migrants worldwide has continued to grow. And in 2017, the number reached 258 million. 258 million as of last year. Of these 258, over 60% of all international migrants live in Asia. About 80 million international migrants are in Asia. 78 million in Europe. In Europe. 58 million live in Northern America. 25 million in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbeans, 10 million. 10 million. According to the International Migration Report of the United Nations, two thirds of all migrants live, however, in only 20 countries. In only 20 countries. Amongst these are the United States of America, Saudi Arabia, Germany, and the Russian Federation. The majority of migrants live only in a few nation states. With this said, allow me to also note that today, women comprise, women are indeed in the majority of international migrants. There was a time when women were in the minority of people moving from one part of the world to the other. Today, they are in the majority of people moving across national boundaries. And so consequently, we speak about the feminization of international migration. Furthermore, you may also want to note that the medium age of international migrants worldwide is about 39 years. 39. So generally, the migrant population is becoming younger than ever. It's becoming younger than ever. It's also important, it's very significant that we note that as we speak about international migration, as we speak about international migration, migrants are not only residing in the high income countries, but there are a large number of migrants in low-income countries. According to the United Nations, you have about 81 million migrants, international migrants, residing in the middle-income countries. 
These figures are significant for us to note. But meanwhile, whilst we are looking at numbers, it is also very significant for us to note that my international migrants are vulnerable people. They are vulnerable from the point of view that they are perceived as a security threat, true or not. When we look at the literature today on international security, most scholars would identify migrants as a source of security. Surely, it's difficult to argue with these types of statements simply because we do not have a generally accepted definition of security. What could be the security issue for a given nation state may not be the same for another nation state. This is so common today in the literature. Secondly, international migrants in some parts of the world are perceived as the source of criminal offenses. True or not, the statistics does not support that. It does not support that. So let's bear this in mind to note that international migrants are vulnerable individuals and since they are highly vulnerable persons, it is therefore necessary that they need some special protection. They need international law to defend their rights. Remember this morning I told you that international human rights law or international human rights are those rights that people enjoy irrespective of whether they are citizens or not. Irrespective of whether they are indeed male or female, etc. International human rights, I said this morning, are universal, they are interdependent, interwoven, and they are inalienable. Having said this, let's therefore now turn our attention briefly to defining what are, what do we mean by international migration law? International migration law simply can be viewed as a branch of international public law. And international public law regulates the relations between, interna between nation states on one hand and international organizations on the other hand. Furthermore, in the post-Cold War era, or long before the post-Cold War era, international law has developed and refo had focused its attention on human rights protection. Consequently, human rights law are an integral part of international public law. Secondly, international migration law can therefore also be seen as an integral part of public international law. Where do we find international law? What are the sources of international law? International law are expressed in the form of agreements. 
in the form of agreements. And these agreements can be either in the form of treaties agreed to either by nation states and international organizations or they could be in the form of customs. Customs. To make it brief, if you were to look at Article 38 of the Statute of the ICJ, you will clearly see that the ICJ in making decisions on cases, on matters, will use treaties, customs. It will use as well principles of international law. It will also use not only these sources, but it can also make references to the writings of Eucharist, etc. So that's where we find international human rights law, and consequently, that's where also we will find international law relating to migrants. International migration law, indeed, is a new branch of international law. International migration law started developing gradually in the era before World War I. However, nation states, nation states holding on to their sovereignty had to the view that nation states had to decide the treatments that migrants ought to enjoy. Gradually do, gradually do, international law started paying attention to the rights of migrants. And since the adoption of the Universal Declaration, we can now surely say that migrants are protected by the various conventions I talked about this morning. The various protocols, optional protocols, that we talked about. But this evening, rather than repeating that, I want us to look at some specific now agreements relating to migrants, etc. And one of these is the International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of all migrant workers and members of their families. This is a landmark convention. Gentlemen, ladies, this landmark convention has been signed by many nation states. However, I submit to you that this landmark convention has been ratified by less than 30 nation states. Consequently, consequently, this landmark convention has not entered into force for many European countries. Forget about the United States because the U.S. is in its own separate category. It's a unique phenomenon. What does this convention provide for? 
Gentlemen and ladies, this convention, landmark convention, tells us that migrant workers, that migrant workers and their families are entitled to human rights protection similar to those of indigenous of the country. Indigenous of the country. Secondly, that these people who are outside of their countries have the right also to form unions. They have the right to fear trial, etc. They have the right to leave and to return and to return. Gentlemen, this fundamental document, though significant for our purposes, remains to be ratified by the number of states required and by leading international players, particularly those in Europe. It is not only the United Nations that is involved in the protection of migrants. Let us this evening look at the international labor organization we are going to do this simply because the International Labor Organization has adopted a series of conventions that do directly relate to the rights of migrants, etc. I want you to look at, please, convention number 97 of the ILO concerning migration for employment or convention number 40, 143 again re relating to the treatment of migrant workers or convention number 87 concerning the freedom of association the freedom of association. There are many more that you may want to look at. It's important that you look at that. But when we talk about the ILO, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, the ILO is one of the legacies of the League of Nations. It's one of the legacies. ILO was established under Article 23 of the Statute of the League of Nations. Though the League of Nations died, I won't say natural death, I won't say that, the ILO continues to exist. And ILO has adopted a series of conventions relating to migrant workers. In fact, I want you to also look at, guys, the ILO convention number 169 relating to indigenous and tribal peoples. Convention 169 relating to indigenous and tribal persons in independent countries. Significant document, significant document. 
And I will say to you guys, my indigenous people for a long time have been denied the right to self-determination. Not everywhere though, have they been able to realize this right to self-determination. But the ILO in its convention 169 indeed is trying to protect them in regards to their rights to form unions, equal pay, etc. As we talk about migrants, I want us also to look at international standards that do relate to social security. These international standards are contained in a series of ILO conventions. And here again, you may want to look at convention number 102 or convention number 117 and 118. There are conventions relating to social security. Social security. When we talk about migrants, surely we must not forget about the issue of nationality and statelessness. The issue of nationality and statelessness. And the corresponding conventions, the corresponding conventions, etc. Whilst we talk about migrants, we ought not to also forget about slavery, slavery, trafficking, smuggling, and other crimes. And if we are talking about the international law, then we have to look at the appropriate conventions, the appropriate documents, etc. But my lecture will not be complete tonight if I do not take you to another level. I have to take you, I'm bound to do this. Otherwise, my talk will be incomplete. And that is, let's spend some time talking about international maritime law. Let's talk about, ladies and gentlemen, international maritime law or international law of the sea. International law of the sea. You hear a lot about people traveling by sea to get to other parts of the world. The third law of the sea conference, the third law of the sea conference adopted in Jamaica in 1982, in 1982, clearly states that every state shall require the master of a ship flying his flag insofar as, insofar as he can without serious danger to the ship, the crew and the passengers to render assistance to any person found at sea in danger of being lost or in danger of being lost. Consequently, consequently, the third law of the sea conference imposes upon nation states, imposes upon nation states, because I say nation states, ships are registered 
under the flag of nation states, that's their nationality, the flag. The ship is a conditional territory of the state. And therefore, therefore that master of the ship has a legal international obligation to render assistance to anyone found at sea in danger of being lost. So, what we hear often about people crossing, whatever assistance you may render, etc., is not a matter of goodwill. It's not a matter of charity. It's not a charitable matter. It's a legal obligation. It is indeed a legal obligation. A legal obligation. And so therefore, the international law of the sea comes into play when we talk about protection of human rights, of migrants. Do migrant rights begin only when they enter into a country? Do migrants' rights begin when they enter only into a country? With this question, I want us to talk about human rights at international borders. I want us to talk about human rights at national borders. Guys, ladies and gentlemen, we are hearing a lot about unaccompanied or separated children or migrants in regular, irregular situations, etc., etc. Gentlemen, the international law relating to international borders is as follows. States have an obligation in implementing controls to protect human rights of those who are at their borders. Of those who are at their borders. Therefore, therefore, the activity of certain nation states at the border that does not conform to international law is indeed a violation. It's indeed a violation. Those states that do violate these types of human rights laws ought to be held responsible. They should be held accountable, whether large or small, <coughs> great or big or not. To whom much has been given, much surely is expected. Without this, you can note that indeed, gentlemen, the international protection of migrants is not in good shape. We are seeing a further erosion of the convention relating to the status of refugees, the status of refugees. And therefore, there are two most important things I want to talk to you about. Namely, the New York Declaration, the New York Resolution of 1620 on gentlemen and ladies, migrants and refugees. Migrants and refugees. This historic document called the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants called upon nation states to work together in handling the present situation where we know 
the human rights of migrants are not be adhered to. The migrants are not, their human rights are not being maintained. They are not being protected. And the New York document, the New York document called upon nation states to negotiate, to negotiate a new framework, to negotiate a new framework on the protection of migrants. The protection of migrants. For a period of two years, nation states met in the United Nations, and in July of this year, they produced what is known as the compact, the compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration. A compact, a treaty, a treaty. I'd like you guys to look at this compact. This compact, according to our last speaker, rightly said, is going to be discussed and adopted at an international conference in Morocco from the 10th to the 11th of December this year. This compact is a historic document, a historic document which attempts to develop on the UN Convention on Refugees. It's an attempt to expand on the UN document on the rights of migrants and their families, as well as previously adopted international legal documents. I want you to look at it at home. It has not yet been adopted, but much work it went into the adoption or the drafting of this document. I'm taking you to a level that I know I must talk about. The President of the United States, that President Trump has announced that U.S. is not going to participate in this conference in Marrakesh. It's another indicator that United States is pulling out of multilateralism. It's moving away from what we call the multilateral institutions, multilateral arrangements, etc. United States has pulled out of the United Nations Council or Human Rights Council. This happened in September. Second important document pulling out of this convention. But guys, here we are, 2018, faced with these complex issues. They are not easy to talk about. They require a lot of thinking. And they require us to pay attention to what is going on. To what is going on. The countries, the areas that are more affected are going to be at Marrakesh. But United States is not going to be there. This is regrettable. It's regrettable. If you have any opportunity of calling your legislator, of calling your senator, call your senator and tell your senator what is going on. What the hell are you doing? Sorry. 
I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. This is important. This is dear to me. That's why I'm talking like this. And so, international law today protects not only nationals, but it does also protect migrants as well. It does protect migrants because migrants are human beings. And as human beings, they are entitled to fundamental human rights. I thank you. asylum seekers that are going um, on dinghy boats, whether they be from Libya or from Turkey. Um, there's been countless times that the Libyan Coast Guard and the Turkish Coast Guard have um, been documented as committing crimes against humanity, against those asylum seekers that are in the water, whether it's letting them drown, drowning them themselves, um, how are they supposed to be held accountable for those crimes? Those people have to be brought to trial. They must be tried. And if the country that they represent fails to bring them to trial, then the ICC will step in. Surely, as my colleague said, Dr. Blake rightly said, the ICC is not a court of first instance. It's complementary. And therefore, the nation states where these culprits are have a responsibility to investigate and to charge those individuals because the third law of the sea convention clearly spells out the obligation of the coastal states as well as the responsibility of the crew, the master, etc. There is no way you can leave that. It's an offense. Yeah, I think it's just frustrating because it's not happening. It's happened so often and it's not and we're not seeing that. And I think it's even crazier to see um, NGOs going and saving those people and being blocked by those Coast Guard ships. It is regrettable to say that not many people know about the Law of the Sea Conference or Convention. Not many people. Not many people understand the relevance of these documents. If you were to talk to my other good uh, friend, I so like the guy that I think of him all the time, Mr. John Bolton. John Bolton is going to say to you, oh, these are political documents. That's what he said. That's what John Bolton said. He said that treaties are just political documents. But that's not the matter. Treaties are legally binding documents and that the principle of Pacta Sun Servanda applies to them. We need to educate people about the law of the sea as well. You need to talk about the law of the sea. What do you think? As I said today, as I said this morning, there is a lack of political will yeah. on behalf of states. We are still 
dealing with the issue of the lack of accountability. We are dealing with this issue of global justice, the issue of impunity, still around. They are not gone. Maybe the signs were better at the end of the Cold War, but today, no, it's not getting better. Maybe the more things change, the more they remain the same. We've got a lot of work here to do, and you've got a lot of work to do. And thanks to the NGOs for what NGOs are doing. What do you say? Okay. Any more questions? I did not talk about international humanitarian law. Its impact, its importance in dealing with international migration. We'll leave that for another time. The relevance of international humanitarian law since 1948. How international humanitarian law has developed and continues to develop since 1948. Particularly when we are dealing with the issue of counter-terrorism. Terrorism, counter-terrorism, and human rights. And human rights. That's another biggie. Do terrorists have human rights? The suspects, those who are awaiting trial, do they have any human rights or not? I wish we would get into that at another stage. I wish we can get into that because it's an important matter. It's an important issue. Terrorism and counter, uh, counter terrorism and human rights protection. Thank well, you. Thank you, sirs. Yes, sir. Thank you.